So um, I guess I'll just start with a quick background on myself. So I was a former Pennsylvanian that moved here in 1980 and 1990, bought an old house and then started researching old houses, which once you do that, leads you down rabbit holes and you find all kinds of things that you'd like to research. And one of the things that I ended up doing was looking for a specific architect, Septimus Bowler. And when I looked him up, it said he was participating in a contest uh, for Architect Avenue. And I was familiar with streets, but was not familiar with, never heard of Architect Avenue. So I looked it up on a map and was surprised to find where it was located in the furthest reaches of Hennepin County. And then I was lured down the rabbit hole of what is this contest all about? And so that story and my findings are what we're gonna learn about today. And hopefully you'll uh, learn a little bit about lost history that has been found again. Again, my background is I came from Pennsylvania and I grew up in a steel town and there is a little bit of a tiny connection to that too. But since I'm running just a little bit late, I at least will get started here and will tell you the story about why Architect Avenue became Architect Avenue and what it really means. The excitement was building, quite literally. September 17th, 1905 was drawing closer. Only a week to go, great reveal. The six homes were in their final stages of completion. The ads were running in all the papers. Real estate men all over the country were watching this unique scheme of suburban planning with much anticipation as it was the first of its kind ever suggested in the country. What architect and what and house would win the competition? Who would win the auction for the winning house? Who would win a $10 gold piece? Who would win the building lot that was free? A festival day was planned for September 17th, with popcorn, music, witty speeches, free streetcar rides for attendees. I guess I need to go to my PowerPoint presentation here too. Get me started. And now we'll go down here and we will share screen. Uh, so I can get going here. So I'm calling this uh, presentation, uh, go back here a second here, a 20th century vision, because this was really the first of its kind that was being ever started in the country. So hurry up, get ready today. Meet me on Architects Avenue on Sunday. So what was all about Architect Avenue? Why in this farthest reach of Hennepin County? What was the draw for such a grand promotion? It was only a tiny composite of people. It was a composite of Scandinavian and German farms, a burgeoning little amusement park, and an industrial plant on the northernmost part of Hennepin County. In this area was actually the highest point of the, the attached four counties, overlooking the city above the smells, the industrial boom of the riverfront. In earlier years, so we're going to set the stage 15 years prior to 1905 or thereabouts. In 1888, Minneapolis Improvement Company had been organized and platted an area known as the Annex Plat in northern Hennepin County. Speculation in real estate was the biggest investment that people could do at that time. You couldn't go into the stock market, you couldn't have hedge funds, you didn't really have banks that would. Uh, have CDs. So if you had money, you actually invested in land, especially in the Midwest, because this was an opportunity to grow and expand and make a lot of money. So land was available, but most of the land was already platted south of the Mississippi River and south of Minneapolis. Most of the land for housing was established in 1884 through 1890. The only places really left were north of Minneapolis uh, in the northern reaches of the county and heading into Anoka County where the farmlands were. Another thing that happened at this point in time was modern transportation was coming into play. And Thomas Lowry was a big candidate and proponent of modern technology. And he had started the streetcar company in Minneapolis 
actually he acquired it, and then he acquired the St. Paul Company and merged the two together to become the Twin Cities Rapid Transit Company. With transportation, people could get further afield and they could buy land and houses further afield from their jobs. So this is another thing that came into play. The, there was at that time a little village called Columbia Heights with about 20 residents, 20 houses, about 100 residents and a few stores. And they were trying to advertise to, to become larger. And so they even advertised that they needed a butcher, they needed a dry goods store, they wanted a shoe store and a meat market. And at one point they even said, if you don't have a meat market, then there's gonna be a lot of missing dogs in the neighborhood. So that they were really encouraging people to uh, move to this further part of the north of the Twin Cities. And in 1893, another thing happened and that was kind of a disaster. So you have all lived through the 2008, 2009 bank failure and the stock market crash of our time. Back in 1892, 1893, it was even worse. So almost all the banks except one failed in Minneapolis. So if you had money in banks, you were losing it. People who had invested in land were trying to sell it as, as desperately as they could to get cash. And so Thomas Lowry, he was more flush with cash. He was able to take advantage of the situation. So he started buying up land north in the northern part of the county, as well as he had several lots of land over near Lake Harriet and White Bear Lake, et cetera. Because he owned the streetcar company, he was able to, um, build it and they will come. So he actually would build streetcar tracks out to various parts that he owned land in. And so he owned land in the northern part of the county here. He owned land near White Bear. And because of the streetcar, he was able to create a reason to ride the streetcar every other day. So you rode the streetcar Monday through Saturday to go to work, to school, to grandma's house. But on the weekends, he wanted another reason for you to ride the streetcars. And so he built amusement parks. Columbia Heights was no exception. There was a little amusement park. He actually didn't start it. It was called Forest Park uh, up about 40th and off of Central, but his streetcar went there. So this is just a map that's showing uh, where we're gonna be looking here. We're gonna be looking up here, off of Central. And this is now what's called Columbia Park area. A little bit closer detail, we can see um, that here's the Columbia Park, Central Avenue, 40th, and Columbia Heights that we know today is north of here. Where he's buying land is not only there, but here as well. And one of the reasons he had originally purchased land up here was that the streetcars were originally pulled by horses. And horses can't necessarily pull a streetcar all day long. So you have to change the horses out. And he would, ex he would build barns and in Northern Hanford County, he even had pasture land so that you could switch the horses out. And in my neighborhood, which is the wedge, he also had another barn and where he kept his horses and could switch them out midway. And then further South, he also had. So he spread the horses and the barns out. In North Minneapolis then, up in about 37th Street, he had pasture where he could turn on horses on a long-term basis. But electricity came into place. And so with electricity came the ability to expand transportation further, further in all directions. And so people could live further away from their work and from their school. So in this area here, we had uh, the border site is bounded by 37th Avenue, Northeast Central Avenue. Again, it's north of Columbia Park. And the interesting thing was in this part of the world, if, if you live there, you know that the streets are named in order by the presidents. And so it's curious to me that we had an architect avenue in the middle of the presidents. And that was really very curious. It turns out that architect avenue was actually an extension of Jackson Street. Another person who was planning on taking advantage of the situation in the area was James J. Hill, our, our railroad man of the year and of the century, I guess. 
he built all the railroads, especially that were heading west. And out of St. Paul and Minneapolis, he was going even to Duluth. And he was planning on building a new site for the Pittsburgh of the Midwest along the Mississippi. There was access to water. You had access to the iron up on the iron range. He even had access to coal. And he said, why should we send all this to Pittsburgh? We can be the Pittsburgh of the Midwest. But again, 1893 came along and kind of dashed that. And actually you probably should be happy that he didn't become the Pittsburgh of the Midwest. I grew up in Homestead, which was the site of the Homestead Steelworks outside of Pittsburgh and the site of the Pinkerton detective instigation that actually killed people. And this is an early site of my hometown, which is showing the soot, the dust. It, this is actually a clear day. So you can see that you probably wouldn't have wanted to be the Pittsburgh of the Midwest. We'll zoom in a little closer and you can see that, that James J. Hill had all these railroad lines. There still are some uh, in connection here. And we know that the Sioux line shops are down off the central um, to south of Columbia Park and the what they call the Shoreham Yards. He also sent his tracks out and up to Duluth. So technically it would have been a good place to put a steel town, but just be happy it didn't. Our subject here is the Architect Avenue, which is located just in this Northern pocket right around uh, various railroad tracks. And that was a good thing because there was an incentive for people to come and industrialize after James J. Hill didn't open up the land. Now there was this railroad spur that's located between 40th and 37th in this land. And he was, Lowry was starting to attract industry to come. There was a Minneapolis foundry that was located just off of this area. There was quarries down here. He even enticed a wagon factory to come from Sock Center and it was going to become called the Columbia Heights or the Columbia Wagon Factory. They were going to hire people uh, to build these wagons seven days a week, et cetera. But in 1905, things kind of didn't go that way. We had the invention and more and more people available to buying automobiles so that wagons weren't necessarily the big commodity that they thought it was going to be in the United States. They also didn't have a lot of people to do the work. So Lowry had divested himself of his horses and his uh, ability up here to be at the end of the streetcar route, but he still had the land. And he decided, I'm gonna subdivide it and I'm gonna build housing. And I'm gonna entice people to move here with all kinds of incentives. And, but he himself wasn't the great promoter. He was the entrepreneur, but he decided to hire one of his local neighbors. And so they came up with this scheme and this plan to have Columbia Heights division here. He also had a subdivision here. And you'll notice a couple of things with this particular drawing. This is from 1898. So he was already thinking ahead into the future here. You'll notice that housing lots were really very straight lined out. So we had rectangular lots on a grid, uh, east, west, north, south lines. That's typically how we see at least Minneapolis. Now, St. Paul grew up a little earlier uh, and they were more uh, not so rigid as land developers came into place at this time. And you'll see this is different. So we have something that's curving and the lot sizes are different. And this was why this was being watched around the country because this was a planned community that was gonna be started with this contest. But it wasn't a planned community like a company town like Hershey. This was being planned as an individual grouping uh, by the big marketeer named Walton. Just a little close up shot here. And even side by side, we can see that We've got the traditional grid system, and then we have this kind of unusual shape to it. It's a picture of Thomas Lowry. Again, he was basically a real estate investor. He was innovative, he was a visionary, 
and he operated, he was born in 1843, and unfortunately he died early at 1909. But he hired his neighbor, who was known as a well-known marketeer. This was Edmund Walton. And Edmund Walton was this dashing debonair Englishman. He'd been born in 1865 in London. He came to America in the 1880s, married a lady from Missouri, and then he moved to Minneapolis. And he quickly, um, whether he brought a fortune with him or not, he was very much an entrepreneur and really had ideas that really meshed with Thomas Lowry, his neighbor. One of the things that Walton is known for is um, this wonderful house that he actually built on Mount Curve, which is in on Lowry Hill, again, one of the neighbors to Thomas Lowry. And this was, uh, he called it Grey Court. You know, if you're in England, you put names to your houses. And so he called this one Grey Court. He and his wife and his three daughters lived here. If you're familiar with Mount Curve, Douglas Drive up off of Hennepin going up the hill, this is opposite what a little park called Seven Pools. But unfortunately the house was torn down in the 1960s, 70s. The Unitarian Society bought the land and bought another house and took over and built their property. Um, this great court area owned all the land down to Hennepin Avenue and he had these wonderful gardens. And he was actually the founder of the Minneapolis Garden Club and really instituted contests for people who wanted to show off their beautiful flowers, et cetera. In 1917, uh, Walton, because of his English heritage, was also um, hired by the governor to go to England and to be the liaison for World War I between the cities and the British and the Americans. Again, he had lots of money and he could hire the best. One of the best known decorators at that time was John Scott Bradstreet, and he was the decorator to the wealthy. And you could see that this wouldn't exactly be my taste today, but based in 1900, all the rage was based on architecture that came from the world fairs. And the world fairs really caught the attention of people who were intrigued by the Middle East and Asian imports, et cetera. And this is a Moroccan influence. You could see layers and layers of carpets and all kinds of pillows for comfort, over the top fabrics. And I'm the Moorish lantern here. There's probably a hookah hiding in here someplace. I can't see that. And then what looks to be ceiling embellishments of all kinds hanging down. It's like so over the top. And then shortly after this period became the arts and crafts movement, which was a total, uh, I guess, 180 degrees from this particular look. But John Bradstreet was the known man to hire if you had money. This is outside the Gray Court House. And one of the things that Walton also did because he was promoting land, he was really trying to be in with the Minneapolis Park Board and make sure that there were parks near the houses that he was building, that houses were near parks, that people had amenities. And so he really catered to the Minneapolis Park Board. And here he's actually taking his chauffeur um, and he's driving Jesse Northrup, who was president of the Park Board at that time, to go on what became known as the Grand Rounds. So way back when they established the concept that we want all the parks to connect. We want everyone to be within just several blocks of a trail and access to fresh air, et cetera. So just reiterating a little bit here, Lowry had bought the land. Um, he already had some, but then in the panic of 1892, he was able to acquire more land at really good prices. He created the um, Arcade Investment Company in order to start selling that land. He hired Walton as his general manager because he was the guy that knew all the marketing techniques. They were also promoting housing and land going up Reservoir Avenue, which goes off to the right and up to the highest point of land within the Fort County region. And they were gonna sell those properties for uh, much more money and have grander houses very similar to Lowry Hill. 
also one of the marketing schemes they had was that if you bought a property from us, we'll also give you free quarry stone to lay your foundations. And in Columbia Heights, there were several quarries, but there were two that were well known. You will also have easy streetcar access because of Central Avenue and 40th. And a big promotion was if more houses are sold, I will do a double trap up Central Avenue. And the first year you buy the house, you would even have free streetcar transportation. I mentioned there's two quarries, uh, at least there was at that time. So there was Cook's Quarry, which was located at St. Anthony Parkway and State Street at the time, and the Blue Limestone Quarry at 15. 29 Central, which is now the Quarry Shopping Center. So if you're familiar, obviously, with the Quarry Shopping Center, that's how it got its name, because it was a bluestone quarry, blue limestone quarry. So going back to the streetcars, which gave people the opportunity to live further away from where they worked. If they worked downtown at the mills, they could at least travel very easily on the streetcar. This was an example of the Columbia Heights and Bloomington streetcar. These, this is probably a car built uh, in the own Twin City shops that were located like on 31st and Lake Street where uh, the bus terminal is right now. But Minneapolis was one of the few companies that actually built its own streetcars. In the summertime, they even experimented with these open air cars, especially on Sundays because they were going out to the various parks that Lowry owned the land at, Lake Harriet to the Bandshell, up to White Bear Amusement Park, Excelsior. They experimented with these kind of uh, open air cars, which are a little different than the ones from California that you see going up in San Francisco because the streetcar actually has seats that face forward or could be moved so they face backwards but not out to the side. So they didn't keep these cars for very long. And again, they were very limited in their summertime usage. This is a picture of a very early streetcar that was drawn by horses. And you could see that dirt roads had to be available so the horses would have traction. This is by a barn and they're obviously switching out some horses. Uh, and I do not know where this particular location is. It, wasn't organized as such. If you go out to Excelsior to the Streetcar Museum, they do have a car like this that was actually converted from being a horse-drawn car. And right now it is the oldest running streetcar in the whole country. It goes back to this era. And so you have an opportunity, you can ride it out in Excelsior. So Arcade was promoting the land. They had an office briefly at, at the middle of 37th and Central. Lots ranged from $300 to $1,450, were mostly the ones up on a reservoir, but the average was about $450. You got free building stone for your foundations. If you bought and build, we would hire you. You got preferential employment, so that was another incentive. And so at that time it was $25 $2,500 home could be had for $25 down and 25 a month. So the 25, 25, 25 kind of scheme was one of the few that was started. You'll see that that kind of changes a little later and becomes 3,500 for 35, 35. And Edmund Walton, he decided uh, as part of this promotion, he was gonna have his own office at 3,700 Van Buren in what was to be known as the uh, they were gonna have a country club, like a clubhouse for anybody who bought land up here. Another big promotion that was going on kind of as a sidebar at the same time was that Thomas Lowry was so enamored of Abraham Lincoln and everything Lincoln that after he had been to the St. Louis exhibition, he determined that he was gonna buy this funeral car that had been on exhibit and had been in bad shape but by 1900, he was able to acquire it and he restored it. And he actually had it at his shops at 37th and Quincy. The 37th and Quincy, beside which had been like their former barns, now there was a housing for the streetcars. He had this car. And then he, in the summertime, put it out in front of the shops and he 
sold like for five cents, you could actually take a tour of the Lincoln town car, the funeral car, I'm sorry. So this was readily available also at the same time that he was promoting this land that you could come out here. And this was kind of a nice draw for immigrants who, who had heard lots of things about Abraham Lincoln. And to see this funeral car was quite, I guess, a tourist attraction. Unfortunately, what happened is because it was placed outside in one of the summers, I think it was in 1911, there had been a grass fire and the grass fire came along and consumed the car. The only thing that was left were like the wheels and some of the hitches, the metal parts. Hennepin History Museum up until recent time actually had several of the parts of, this, of the car. And most recently they decided to donate what they had of the street of the funeral car to the Gettysburg Lincoln Museum so that they would have a more complete. So where we could have seen it here in Minneapolis early in 1900, or you could have seen parts of it at our Hennepin History Museum, they are now out in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So you can, if you go out there, you can have to go see the replica of the funeral car. This was the location. This is off at 37th, and this is actually going. I'm west of Quincy, which are, is back here by the trees. But this area right now is, last time I was there was in the fall, uh, is more of a recycling center. And I think some auto body shops are kind of held in here, et cetera. So it's still kind of open and not developed. And this is the dividing line for Columbia Heights in Minneapolis. Wallace's promotion, he was, you could tell when he's promoting because he comes up with some strange schemes. On the left-hand side, we have this lovely lady who kind of looks like Princess Di, I guess, on the side, known as Miss Columbia Heights. And then we have this ogre kind of a Romanesque person. Don't live in a flat and get dyspepsia. Come live with us at Columbia Heights and get perpetual youth. If you're out of work, we carry your payments without charge until you get a job. Not longer, however, than six months because you just might naturally be lazy. If you're sick, we provide free doctor's advice and carry your payments until you are well. Not longer, however, than six months. If you're born, we'll give your parents a bag of silver dollars and attend your christening. Well, who wouldn't be enticed to go buy a piece of property up there with those kind of incentives? There was to be a clubhouse. It was to be built at 3700 Van Buren. It was supposed to be Spanish revival style, which in 1905 was becoming one of the most popular styles along with colonial style in America. It was going to house the offices of the Cross Country Hounds, the North Country Club, the Northeast Country Club, and the offices also of the Arcade Investment Company. There is a home today at that location, but you'll see that it's not in the style that was being planned. So Lowell Lamoureux was an architect and he had designed lots of major buildings. And the, the picture on the front of my, here we go, is the plan that he put in place that he was gonna have for this clubhouse. So again, Spanish revival style, you know, there's an entrance here. And then there's like a bridge over water. Now, you who live in Columbia Heights will know that there really isn't a place to put a bridge and water at that location. So it's kind of interesting and probably a logical reason why it was never built. However, in 1910, Lamoureux designed this building at the Jackson Square Field House just south of Columbia Park. And it looks very similar in feeling. So he didn't exactly lose the plans for this building. He kind of reinvented them down here. That the uh, field house was torn down, I think in about 1952, because it was not built on a very solid footing. It had a lot of marshy problems. And so in the 50s, it was replaced uh, with the new building that's there now. But needless to say, the clubhouse as was planned was never built, but they did put a clubhouse. And this is a house that actually is sitting um, on the corner up there. I'm sorry, this is an early picture taken out of the newspaper from about 1910 just after it was built. It has a brick lower uh, first floor and then it's a uh, clabbered upstairs, but it's a far cry from the elaborate clubhouse that was being 
pictured originally. And again, if you drive over there or walk over there, you'll see that on that corner, there is something similar. And I think I did pull the building plan on that house and it said it was built in 1916, but actually it was built earlier than that. So this is actually a picture from like 1905. They did also recommend uh, a gentleman's club that was built over on 40th and off of 40th. And at the time it was called the Victoria Hotel and you could rent rooms uh, by the week for $7, including meals. Today it's being run as a bed and breakfast. Um, so feel free to drive over there as well. So let's find out what was going on with this contest. Obviously land wasn't selling really as fast as he wanted to. So Lowry and Walton concocted this contest and they first started promoting it in February of 1905. It was gonna be open to all major architects in the Twin Cities. The criteria was that the house had to cost less than $1,500. And kind of remember that because it didn't happen that way. Had to have seven rooms, include landscaping, be designed for efficiency and beauty as well. As much beauty as you could put into it uh, compared to a large house. And then the winning house was supposed to be auctioned off that day. The contestants were the first prize to the architect was supposed to be $1,500. The architect who had built the most complete cottage for $1,500 combining luxury, elegance, utility, and comfort would win the day. And this would be voted on not only by Thomas Lowry, but also by the park board. And then he invited the community to come on that day, September the 17th, 1905, to place your vote for which house you think met the, the criteria and should win the prize. There were 18 local architects who submitted their designs, including Septimus Bowler, the gentleman that got me down this rabbit hole, uh, Bowman Cardella, Downs and Eads, Obermeyer, Ernest Kennedy, uh, Kinsport, Carl Struck. These were just some of the, the major architects who were submitting, but only six could be selected. The six were Fremont Orth, which should be a familiar name since the great courthouse of Walton was designed by Fremont Orth. Lowell Lamoureau, who had presented the design for the clubhouse. Walter Keith, who was a purveyor of house plans. He was also an architect with his brother, but he came up with a totally different scheme of promoting house plans. William Kenyon, who was uh, a fairly recent addition to the Twin Cities architectural scene, but he was most noted for designing for the Sioux Line Railroad. He designed depots and facilities for the Sioux Line, wherever that was. That was his primary job. And I'm Lansing Dorr uh, was a local gentleman and Bertrand and Chamberlain were local designers of major commercial buildings. So we'll take those in individual. So the final contestants and designs that were submitted was Architect Avenue Columbia Heights was one of the promotions. And here's the six designs and how much they were gonna cost, et cetera. All six houses were gonna be built by one builder. And that was the Ronald McMillan Construction Company who were known for building residences as well as uh, commercial structures. So, and that actually was one advantage to having one builder. So in March of 1905, Thomas Lowry and Walton took the chosen architects out to pick a piece of property that they wanted to do to build on. And then because there was one builder, he could consolidate workers, he could consolidate supplies, and he could simultaneously be building all six designs at one time with the target of being completed by September 17th. Adam Lansing Doors is that was a local uh, person who built fine residences and hotels. On the left here is a house that he built on the west, on the east side of Lake of the Isles at about 22nd Street. Uh, the house today has been painted white, but it was known as the, the Keys residence. He also did commercial structures such as the Continental Hotel downtown, which is at about 
12th and LaSalle. And today it's more of a housing, uh, low income housing uh, for, for people, but it still does exist. Unlike a lot of the houses and structures of other architects. This was the house that he proposed. So Adam Lansingdorf proposed this little bungalow and it was gonna have like diamond shaped windows, little dormers. It was on top of a little hillside. And you'll notice here the prices, we went from $1,500, we're now kind of at $3,500 as we're promoting. This is how the house on the right looks today. So it's very similar. Uh, the porch has been enclosed, but it still has these little pentamented uh, details. Uh, there are still diamond paned windows. And the, recently there have been some additions to the back of the house, but by and large, this house looks very similar to the way that it was originally conceived and built. Um, about, but this was one of the two houses that were not complete by the time that of the September 17th visit. So you'll actually see here, there's like a horse and carriage and there is lots and lots and lots of people. So they had great weather, but the house here was, the dormer wasn't complete, et cetera. You notice there's no trees. It's pretty open land here. Um, and so this picture was taken uh, during the event and became one of the houses that was still unfinished at the time, but you could still tour it up to a certain point. Walter Keith's company was another one who designed uh, plans for 3609 Architect Avenue. He could do large houses. This is the Sumner Mansion on Park Avenue. He did the, the Powers Department Store, which became Penny's, which I believe now is Gavaday Commons. This was torn down in my lifetime here in the 1990s, I think 1993, to make Gavaday. But where Keith really made his mark is that he and his brother decided to come up with a monthly magazine called Keith's Home Builder. In that, he would put plans for houses. Some months he would have cottages, some months he would have expensive brick houses, and he would have articles about various rooms and decoration and gardening within it. So it was kind of like the ladies home journal, but you could buy plans. And rather than building six houses a year by having plans available at $15, then Keith was able to build like 700 houses in one year across the entire country because his magazine went all over. His design for the house to meet the criteria was a Dutch gambrel. And you'll recognize this as kind of a typical like Dutch barn kind of roof line, which gives you a lot of room upstairs. So this was as the house was conceived with an open porch, uh, a lot of intricacies, cut out windows. And on the right hand side is how the house looks as of today, it's been painted uh, a green. And they enclosed the front porch and they also had, I have been in this house, they took out the walls to make the living room area in this area so much bigger. Uh, but by and large, an attractive roomy house. Bertrand and Chamberlain were other major architects. They did many commercial buildings, including Minneapolis Athletic Club, the Shriners Hospital over on East River Road, uh, many commercial buildings downtown, but they also did residences as well. So for them to enter this contest, it would be a challenge because their house was supposed to be so much smaller, but still maintain some of the beautiful design that they were used to doing. They too came up with the Dutch Gambrel house style with a Palladian window and this with a, a porch in the front. And this is how the house looks today. So the Palladian window is gone. The front porch is kind of gone. On one of my earlier walking tours, a family who had grown up in this house uh, had come along on the tour, which was great to see them. And they mentioned some stories about um, some fire damage and some rickety steps going to the basement but it was fun to have a family who actually lived in this house on the tour. William Kenyon is probably most known for in Minneapolis, uh, at least my neighborhood for the Glick Mansion, which is situated on a triple lot uh, at 25th and Bryant Avenue. But he also was known for 
besides the Sioux line shops, building a lot of Tudor revival houses, which was the most popular and probably today is still considered probably the most popular style of the era um, across the country. So this was his own house that he designed at 1715 James Avenue um, in Lowry Hill. So again, he would be, he had a lot of houses in this neighborhood. He would have been known to Walton. He would have been known to Thomas Lowry. So William Kenyon was gonna to have to build something. And of course it would fall that he would take this Tudor style that he was known for. And he came up with this Tudor revival style as well with the stucco and the timber framing, et cetera. The house does maintain pretty much its same footprint. The porch has changed. Um, I think this too had had a damage and some and a fire, uh, which denoted some of the changes that happened with it. But you'll see that it still follows through with his typical design plan. Fremont Orf, as I mentioned, he was the designer of the Great Courthouse. So be logical that he would be chosen. And they're most noted for a wide variety of houses, left being the Van Dusen Mansion, which is on LaSalle. And right now, I think it's a venue for events and bed and breakfast, Airbnb, but he also prior to that was the home of the Aveda uh, Beauty Products before they moved their facility over to St. Anthony. Orff was also a known builder and designer of courthouses. And so this is the one from Olivia in Renville County that, again, typical, a lot of brickwork, a lot of stonework. And so a departure for them would actually be participating in this contest. And I kind of call it the Black Forest House here. This is the house as it was designed. And it said, the beautiful cottage is designed by Fremont Orff Architects and it is registered in the Columbia High School Competition. The house is planned with an eye to the picturesque situation in which it will be placed upon rising ground surrounded by many trees. This house is actually placed on the corner um, at 36th and Architect Avenue. A couple things have changed in the interim. Originally it was built with what we call a cat slide roof with this dormer and an open porch and like an ingle nook in this area with a fireplace. At some point in time, uh, a resident took out the cat slide roof and built an enclosed porch, but it still maintains a lot of the beautiful charm of the woodwork and the details that you see. And I guess I would call it kind of a, a black forest kind of cottage. Lowell Lamoureux, who was supposed to design the clubhouse, um, was well known. He was a local born and bred person. Uh, his family was one of the first pioneers to the cities in the 1850s. And he designed many varieties of buildings from the original HCMC, which hospital, city hospital, which was then torn down to make uh, what we know of today as the hospital. He did the central YMCA, which is still in existence. And then many fine residences, including this house, uh, uh, Boutel, that's up on Mount Curve in not too far from what was the Thomas Lowry Mansion as well. So for him, another departure in size was to build a, a smaller house. Um, and you can see this is how the house was designed with a screened in porches. Originally, and this one sits up on the hill as well, the entrance was off to the left. A later resident built more river rock. And actually, I think it's a very charming addition and centralized the open door uh, to the house to the screened in porch because it really anchors the house to the property and really has kind of a nice feel or it's not too far at the time when it was built, it would have been actually the only house overlooking down the hill to Columbia Park. There's now a house next to it. Um, get my mouse here to work. Over to this side, that's actually on the corner that overlooks the Columbia Park and the railroad tracks. Again, just a nice charming, but very much a departure from the grand houses that would have been built by him. So one of the promotions was this 
kind of drawing that you can oversee all six houses. So we're actually on the west. This would be, I think, 36th Street. And we're looking south to the, to the Twin Cities and to Columbia Park. So this is Architect Avenue as it curves up the hill. This is the Orff House, the Keith House. You can barely see it here. The Door House. This is the uh, Chamberlain, Bertram Chamberlain House, the Canyon House, and then the Lamoureux House is here. So they're all six really close together. They're all very walkable so that uh, when we're done, you, we're gonna send you out a handout that you can actually go and follow and go see all these houses for yourself. Another unique feature about this promotion was that at the time it was being built, the park board was very much involved in creating the grand rounds and connecting and acquiring land. One of the things that they were promoting was to follow the contour of the land. Frederick Law Olmsted built Central Park. He also had two architect friends, which were Cleveland and Manning, Warren Manning, who were from out east, who were hired by our park board in the 1890s to come to Minneapolis and help design the park system. And they incorporated this new concept of landscape design and development, which is follow the contour of the land. Don't level the land. Go along with the curves, as I had shown you originally in the original slide. Instead of doing square grids and properties, let's, let's build something a little different. And this is another reason why it was being hailed across the country as a unique experiment. And you could see that the actually, it follows this contour. One of the things they decided to do in here was to build a little lake of pleasure. And it's difficult to see, but in this area between the houses is going to be this little lake that you can ice skate on in the winter time. You can canoe with your sweetheart in the summertime. You can just take walks around it. So this little lake of pleasure was also one of the intriguing promotions. Also on one of my early tours, there was a lady who said, well, what about the boulders? You didn't say anything about those. And I said, well, what about the boulders? And she said she had understood that there was a boulder placed in front of each of the houses. Well, to denote which ones were actually part of the contest. Why well, I only ever found three and maybe a fourth one. Uh, you really had to look hard, but this one definitely is in front of this house and this one's in front of the Oreth house. So they're placed there for a reason. There is another house on the block that is surrounded by multitudes of big boulders. It's not one of the contest. And I did go and ask the owner if by any chance he had borrowed some of the other boulders in front of the houses. And he said, no, I brought all these in uh, for myself. So we know that these boulders were put here at some point in time and, and not part of uh, the other gentleman that, that has quite a lot of boulders on his property. But I like the story and I, I'm going to incorporate it. So comes along September, meet me Sunday afternoon, Columbia Heights. But owing to the lack of copper, the street railway company has unfortunately been unable to run through cars as yet. But next Sunday, the 22nd, I propose to celebrate the opening day of through car service with fireworks and have ordered 2000 tickets good on every car given away to our friends, your friends, and their friends. After that, we'll have a through five minute service and the quickest and best in town. Next Sunday, in order to give you something to come for and also to have you see two houses, I want to sell you about 40th Street. I intend to stand on a lot from 2.30 to 4.30 in the afternoon and to give every man and woman who asks a ticket good for a drawing, which will take place promptly at 4.30. The lucky winner will receive a deed to the lot. I stand on free and clear of encumbrance. I'm doing this to attract you to a particular spot I desire you to see. It will be right near the streetcar. Children will not be allowed to receive tickets as I wish the lot to fall in the hands of a resident. For further information on this point, ask any of my assistant managers. I must insist. And here's actually a floor plan of the Adam Door Lansing Door House that was not complete at that time, but it does give a nice floor plan for getting along. 
And again, we're advertising those six houses, trying to drum up business. So the day dawned, bright and warm and clear, and everything was almost in readiness. But only four of the houses were actually completed at that time. Thousands of people rode the streetcar and they came to see everything that was going on here. At two o'clock today, the homes will be open for your inspection. We want your judgment on the prettiest cottage. At two o'clock today, our numbered flats will be ready for distribution to make someone the lucky owner of a lot number six and block 85, which was actually a couple blocks away. At two o'clock today, music will commence, popcorn will commence to pop, and lunch stand will be open for business. At 3.30, no more plots are distributed. The drawing will take place and the lucky lot owner will be required to make a speech. Come and be the lucky man. Now he didn't say anything about women, but he did say you could be the lucky man. See for yourself, come and have your picture taken. At four o'clock, everyone will be asked to step over to the house he likes best and deposit his vote with a teller. So in front of each house, there was supposed to be a teller in a box and you put your vote in the house that you thought met the criteria. The land not being counted, nor the city water, nor any of our other various improvements. Be sure and come. I expect 5,000 people. It will be a gala day. Never were such beautiful homes ever built for sale before. They have been most carefully and splendidly built. They're all experiments of the best work of the six best architects in the city. They're all different in design and the use of materials and they're all built so that a lady can be her own housekeeper. Oh, well, that's a real draw. Terms of sale. We will finish the houses to the most minute particular, including such a heating plant as you may want and sell each house for $300 down $30 a month, including interest. But never mind the price, fit the house if you want it. You will never get such another chance. The average size of this lot is 70 by 150 feet and each house will have city water and electric light. So which one was everybody's favorite? And I'm actually pretty sure that they actually didn't have the auction because several of the houses were still for sale uh, a, a year later. So I'm gonna ask you to vote based upon the information that you see here for uh, houses one through six, which I will put the pictures up so you can have uh, a look here. So we have Lamarose Country Cottage on the hillside, Kenyon's Tudor Revival, Orff's Forest Fantasy, Bertrand Chamberlain's Four Square uh, Dutch Gambrel also, Keith's Gambrel and Doors Bungalow. So house one, two, three, four, five, six. And I think you can put your um, tally into the chat box. Is that right, Will? You're going to do that for us and tally up the chat box? Yep. If everyone uh, is able to uh, put their uh, answer in the chat, that'd be great. So we will uh, give you some time to pick house number one, two, three, four, five, six. Do, 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 do. Are we getting some votes in there? Yep, so far we have about uh, four votes for number three. Number uh, a couple three. votes for number okay. one. Okay. And one vote for number four. Okay, and I see we have like a total of 24 participants. I hope most of them can participate and vote in the chat box. Give you another minute to pick again. This was uh, Lamoureux's house. We have Kenyon's house, Orff's. This was Bertrand Chamberlain. We have Keith Brothers. And then we have the Adam Door house. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Right now we have a tie between uh, number uh, three and number one. Number one and number three. Okay. So. We're going to see who actually won the contest. Now, I realize you, you all didn't get a chance to go in the houses, 
And I've only been in two of them uh, since then. So the winner was, surprise, surprise, it's actually the Keith Brothers house. And the interesting thing about the Keith Brothers is I mentioned that they had um, a magazine, then they sold house plans. So the following January, they actually had on the inside cover, this was the inside cover of the magazine. So here's the winning house and you can see lots of people out here. The floor plans are published and it says here, the simple treatment given in this cottage home is the making of it. The house is estimated to cost with a full basement heating and ventilating system, $1,700. This includes hardwood, sitting room and dining room and both stories, the large porch columns give a solid and substantial appearance. Particularly attractive is the little hall with its seat and half screen staircase. The little bay in the dining room has a shelf for flowers. The windows of this bay are of leaded glass and with plants on the shelf will make a pretty feature in this room. So the house design went on to become uh, Keith's plan number 1106 in January and cost $15. Now, a couple of years ago, I was on a lovely home tour of Dayton's Bluff. It's like a three hour walking tour and really covered a lot of territory. And I was shocked because going up one of the streets, I saw the same house. So in Dayton's Bluff, I know that they sold the house plans from this house to this house, which still maintains its original integrity. So it still has the original look and feel and about two weeks later, I went back to the house and knocked on their door and introduced myself and handed them a copy of my research report. And they let me come in. And even the interior is original to the plans that were originally outlined. And he says, oh, I'm so happy you came by. You solved our problem. Our neighbors were always insisting that we had a Sears kid house. And I said, no, nope, you have a Keith Brothers house, which was actually better because it was local. So um, I'm hoping to go back, but if you are out and about touring, you will know that on Dayton's Bluff, we do have a similar matching house. So this was, the, the Orff house was actually the second prize house. And it's no surprise that you all picked this because every time I do a tour, this is the, everybody's favorite anyway. So, and without having been in it, you, you did well here. Um, there was a lady, Mrs. Charles Grosjean, who actually won the $10 gold piece, and a gentleman named John Russell, who was a foreman tinner at the Sioux Line Shop, Sioux Line Shops, actually won uh, the free lot that was given away. And um, I think he ended up building a house, but then he sold it later. So he liked that pretty well as well. And so with uh, the tour and everything that was going on after the promotion, there was obviously a big unprecedented demand for lots at Columbia Heights. The eyes of the world are on Columbia Heights. Take the streetcar out. Prices are going up, come out and see. So he wanted to make sure that he took advantage of the situation. And Edmund Walton, again, was this, you could just about tell when he was writing the script because he had all this good stuff put in here. Uh, put in, we put in city water pipes, connect with General Electric's company waters, wires, give you stone walks to the cars, curb and gutter in the streets, and a beautiful park to look at with the best streetcar service in the city and the finest views. Again, here's that house that was incomplete. And then this is uh, a year later. We still have two houses. So here's our Wayne Keith Brothers house. We have the door house and you can just about see the shore of the lake. So they actually did the lake or pond. The beautiful house on Architect Avenue, the one facing the Lake of Pleasure, which is this one, is the only one left unsold. It's a model of comfort and beauty built on the cottage plant, all polished woods, all polished floors, except for the bathroom, which is tiled with the finest porcelain and silver plumbing fixtures, pipe for gas, wired for electricity, and a great big beautiful basement that is a wonder. Uh, our McMillan contractors built this house which was designed by A.L. Door architect. It was well sodded and bedded with flowering shrubs. Size is 90 by 180 feet. Again, 
when you go out there, so you'll notice, obviously this was in farmland because there are really no trees. They're just freshly planted trees at this point in time. This was an ad in 1908. It shows changes from the rolling prairie to fine residence section in just three years. So you can see several of the houses. This is the Orff house that you voted for in the Keith Brothers house. And again, this pond or lake. Well, that's what it looked like then. This is what it looks like now. So it's all filled in with grass. Architect Avenue with this lake of pleasure has been kept in its present perfect condition by the Columbia Heights Company. Beautiful flowers and flowering shrubbery adorn the banks of the lake in the summer. And in the winter, skating parties are in order every night. Well, unfortunately, there was kind of an argument as to who was going to take care of the land. The park board wasn't going to maintain it. It wasn't their property. This uh, Columbia Heights company was not really in business anymore after 1910. And the residents here, this, whether it was starting to fill in by itself or whatever, I suspect it wasn't very deep. Eventually it just became a grassy spot. And when I was talking to somebody last year, they said there's been some talk about converting this area into either basketball courts, tennis courts, um, but most of the residents want it to stay peaceful and quiet and would just prefer picnic benches uh, or there's a bench here for somebody to sit on and just enjoy the peace and quiet. Um, personally, I would like to see a boulder and bring one of those over and a plaque that talks about this historical view that was happening just a little part of Hennepin County that was being watched by the world. And again, this is the winning house. Uh, I took a picture of it on my first tour. It was blue and white, and now it's this dark green, which actually blends in the neighborhood much better. Recently, I acquired some streetcar photos and this is called the PCC car, which was developed uh, after World War II and was running in the Columbia Heights, going out to 37th and 40th Street to the amusement park as well. Unfortunately, that we had one of the finest streetcar systems in the world and with several things that converged on it, we, after 1954, we no longer have a streetcar system. But who says, maybe we'll come back to that. We also might mention uh, a little bit about redlining because in 1930s, uh, the government was putting forth uh, a new concept called the Home Owners Loan Corporation, which was seeking to encourage home ownership in the country, offering mortgages like Fannie Mae loans. Previous to that, if you wanted to buy a house, you either saved money for yourself or you borrowed from a friend or took a mortgage from an investor. Uh, banks were not necessarily in that business. But with the coming of the depression, et cetera, the government decided as part of the project, they would encourage home ownership. And they designated areas as being blue, uh, super place to live, you know, our mortgages are gonna be paid for, you know, no problem there. And the next category down was green, which was yeah, pretty good. We're going to trust people to pay back our mortgages. Or you could have yellow, which, well, that's marginal. Might require more people to, to build, uh, to put more pump down. And definitely if you were in a pink or red area, we weren't going to give you a mortgage. Very unlikely. And then on the various maps and within the cities, they posted these descriptions. And for 1930, blue status was given to Architect Avenue with this description. This small area is populated by salaried people of moderate means. The homes are constructed of frame and stucco with stucco predominating. Mostly small single homes of one and one and a half story houses. Some rehabilitation is necessary because now these houses have been out here about from 1905 to 19, about 25 years. The houses range in age from 15 years and in cost from 3,500 to 5,000. They're practically all owner occupied. Values are fairly well maintained in this district, the depression shrinkage being about 30% and recovery 40% of the drop. That was after the depression. The Columbia Park and Columbia Municipal Golf Course immediately north, which should really be south of the area are favorable factors. 
And I used to work, volunteer at the streetcar. So I used to drive the Como Harriet streetcar um, and out at Excelsior too, which is why I would encourage anybody to go out there and see it. So I wanted to thank you for uh, participating and hanging in there and voting. And I would encourage you to actually go out and take the handout that we're gonna send out to you and go enjoy a beautiful day, take a picnic, go sit in a little park and learn more about Columbia Heights because this is their anniversary this year. Thank you so very much. Oh, thank we you could much. open it for questions if we want to. Yeah, and then uh, and then a few things earlier this year, we had a uh, presentation with Aaron Isaacs of the Minnesota Streetcar Museum that's on our uh, YouTube page. Uh, that was a lot of fun uh, visiting uh, uh, down Central Avenue uh, with the streetcars. Um, and then, yeah, if uh, anyone has any questions, I know someone emailed me uh, a couple days ago. Uh, their name is Nicole. They said um, their father lives in one of the houses still, and it was uh, her, uh, her, their grandparents' house way back when. Oh, great. Um, someone in the chat, uh, were there any restrictive covenants associated with the homes on Architect Avenue? That's a very good question because um, Edmund Walton, was a promoter of real estate throughout the Twin Cities. And he actually was kind of the father of putting restrictive covenants into his properties starting about 1910. So there's like Walton Hills over by Lake the Isles and there's Walton several editions. And on those after 1910, he started putting covenants into his housing. To my knowledge, because these were all built prior to that, there weren't any covenants. Um, Put in. Usually they're put on at the time that the house is constructed. So to my knowledge, there aren't any that were put at that time. And then there's also going to be an event in uh, September. Kathy, can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, is that about tour. the walking tour? So yep. we're, yes. So in September, um, close to the 15th and 17th anniversary date, uh, we'll actually be doing an actual real walking tour of that area as well. So if you want to wait, come on that time, but I'll probably be telling the story, the same story, but we'll actually be able to see some of the houses in person. But I do encourage you to take the handout and go out yourself, take a bike ride. Um, you can't take the streetcar anymore, but you could at least go up there and see some of these other sites. Yep, I'll be sending out that uh, handout here uh, on Monday and then uh... Uh, uh, Courtney with Courtney O'Brien with the library will be uh, working with uh, Kathy on the walking tour. So feel free to reach out to myself or, or Courtney O'Brien at the library. And we're looking forward to that event in, um, in September. So as uh, you mentioned, there was a Nicole online. Is the Nicole that's online here, the one that still has a family member living on the Arkansas Avenue? Um, I do not see Nicole. Um, on right now. Okay. Oh, uh, I got one. Uh, oh, uh, yes, Johnny McMillan. Yeah. Okay, so he's he's in the family. The McMillans have been living in their home, which is the winning house. Um, for many years, his mother had the house as well. So thanks, Donnie, for for jumping on board here Good to see you. Oh, Nicole raised Nicole. her hand. Okay. Yep. Um, let's see if Nicole can unmute, and then uh, Nikki. They say that um, my grandparents lived at 3644 Architect. Uh, do you know when, the, uh, it's a small newer home, do you know when the smaller homes were added uh, closer to 37th? Um, I haven't researched those houses yet, but it's very easy to do. Um, with the Hennepin County Library Board, there are lots of digital documents that have been uh, downloaded there and you can actually look at the building permit by address and see when your house was actually built. Oh, which is why when I looked up 3700 Van Buren, I found that it was built, it says 1916, but it actually was built closer to this, the same time frame because it was the clubhouse. So it was built in 1905, not 1916. Nicole, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. And, uh, are you the one that's, oh, Don, okay. So you're a McMillan as well. Okay, good. Yeah, McMillan's my maiden name. Donnie's my father, and the house was my grandparents' house, and they'd been in there for, 
I want to say like 40 years. I know the house across the street and your house at one point in time in the 30s was owned by a pair of twin dentists. So the dentist lived in your house and then his brother lived across the street in the, the colonial house. And uh, at that point in time also, he was married to a Colonel Spain's daughter. Now for you who live in the area, there is a Spain Avenue and Colonel Spain was a also a realtor promoter of Columbia Heights, uh, kind of took over after Walton. And so Spain, Colonel Spain actually lived in your house at 3609 as well for a brief period of time until I think he passed away. Yeah, it's a beautiful house. It's, you know, 116 years old and it's held up very beautifully. <laughs> Which is a, a good testament to the architects who actually built, even though they were building smaller houses, they still built really well into the Macmillans who built them. Which I think we did not find a connection to your name. Any other yeah, questions? Yeah, the Nikki Bulgren, her and I went to high school together, and her grandmother lived just up the block from my grandmother, my grandparents. And she's actually the one that sent me the link for all of this, to letting me know that this was going to be going on. And I was like so excited as soon as I saw that, I knew I had to watch. So. Okay. And I knew that my grandparents' house was the one that was the winner because we had talked about that for so long over the years that it was just something that I've always been proud of with them. And they were very proud of it too. They loved their house. Great. So I, I doubt if the uh, lake was there when they moved in. I think it's been long gone. No, I don't recall there ever being a lake there, but the little triangle park that's there we used to play ball there in the summertime and you know back when there weren't quite as many cars as there are now we used to play ball in the street and stuff and it was always just a wonderful neighborhood growing up and all the people that have lived there have been just amazing people and neighbors to my grandparents over the years that um, we recently actually just lost uh, one of the neighbors just up the block from my grandparents he passed away um, two weeks ago of cancer oh but, um, it's, I grew up with his children and it was just an amazing neighborhood. You know, it's a nice, quiet, peaceful neighborhood. The houses are gorgeous and the neighbors have always been just the friendliest people. Great. Thank you for sharing those memories. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Alan Robinson says, uh, they grew up at 3617 architect in the late 1960s. Thank you, Alan. It's good to hear that too. Glad that you came on board to see the little story about it. All right, well, thank my, you. Uh, you're welcome. And again, it's kind of curious because it's not really in Columbia Heights, but it's called Columbia Heights Editions. And it was pre the predecessor, I guess, to the village becoming incorporated into the city. So 